or is it the whole country? I don't know. Good, good answer. Uh, because I've booked a number of guests from your part of the world for later this week, Paul, and I think I'll have to go and uh, change the times. Anyway, I'm glad you got your logistical issues sorted out, your phone and your internet. You're looking good there, my friend. Great to have you back on uh, the programme. A lot has happened since you were last on the show. We were going to speak on Thursday with um, the technical difficulties we didn't, but you wrote a terrific article, but very pessimistic, it must be said, uh, and I'm tweeting it out as we speak, about the Russophobic appointments of Trump, and a key line in the article basically said, I'm paraphrasing, it's just going to be business as usual. After some op optimism for, for, for Trump early doors, as we say in the UK, um, you, 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 you're not so optimistic now. What's, what's been happening? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> Trump uh, seems to have collapsed on his promise to normalize relations with Russia. Everyone that he has appointed, with the possible exception of the Secretary of State, is Russophobic. They believe all this propaganda that Russia is a threat to the United States, uh, that Russia is uh, secretly plotting to put back together the, the Soviet empire. Uh, it may invade Balt the Baltics, uh, Poland. Uh, they keep alive uh, these lies about Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, they keep on going about uh, Putin, uh, the new Hitler, uh, mafia Don, uh, a thug. Uh, when you have the National Security Advisor, the Secretary of Defense, the uh, American Ambassador to the UN, uh, and they talk like this. Uh, uh, this is highly provocative. It's really worse than the Obama crowd was doing. And so uh, I assume uh, Trump is uh, captured by the military security complex. Um, he's done nothing uh, about the CIA's uh, full-scale assault on his presidency, on his credibility. Uh, they continue to um, uh, issue uh, lies. Uh, these lies continue to be uh, repeated incessantly. Uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, MS, NBC. It's just an endless uh, repetition, one lie after another. Uh, and he responds with tweets on Twitter, I think it is. So, uh, you know, he's defeated. <laughs> There's nobody in the government uh, to help him. Um, so, I assume we're going to have um, more conflict and bad relations with the Russians. Uh, and it's gratuitous, it's pointless. And if you have these kinds of bad relations, it creates a situation where uh, if there's a misunderstanding, uh, for example, some false reading of an incoming uh, missile attack, if everyone is uh, on edge, these kinds of false signals are more believable than if everyone is working together to reduce tensions. You know, during the whole Cold War period, there were many instances of both the Soviets and the Americans receiving uh, information of an incoming attack. And no one ever believed them. <laughs> if they had, and somebody had pushed the button, and, and the whole thing would have been over. So that was the importance of the American presidents working closely with the Soviets to reduce tensions. You know, we had all sorts of things. Uh, we were beginning with Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we had Nixon, Assault One, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. We had Salt Two with Carter. We had. Uh, Reagan and Gorbachev uh, ending the Cold War in Reykjavik. Uh, these types of relations between nuclear powers are essential. You, you can't have them uh, at 
high tension because of constant accusations of one against the other. So it's ridiculous. It's a huge risk uh, with uh, humanity, with life on Earth, and it's all em emanating from the military security complex in Washington. Uh, they don't care about these risks as long as the money is flowing to them and the power is there for them. So you have this one group imposing the risk on the rest of the planet. And apparently the President Trump's unable to do anything about it. Let me ask you to consider this. You and I butted heads a few times before Christmas. And I know there's there's a massive experience gap between you and I. You know, I've not been where you've been, Paul. I've not, you know, seen what you've seen. And I'm very respectful of that. And we, we talked before Christmas about the possibility that we might have been, not when I say we, I mean we in the media, in the alternative media, may have been fooled when we were, because we were very certain that the powers that be had anointed uh, Hillary Clinton, that they wanted her and that they had chosen her. She was the chosen one. And I felt that maybe we might have missed the trick. Again, not you, but we. And that because of this guy's type A type personality, because of who he is, that he might have been more easy to manipulate by the awful people that you listed in your fantastic article, these Russophobic uh, people that you listed and I have tweeted the article out there for people to read. Um, he might have been the chosen one all along, and we've been absolutely sold down the river. But you don't buy this still. You don't. Of not. Why? No, I, I, think, uh, I think it was hopeful with Trump until he abandoned uh, General Flynn, because General Flynn uh, was committed to better relations with Russia and was the national security advisor. Um, and General Flynn is also the person who uh, uh, ratted on the Obama uh, regime for organizing ISIS and sending it to Syria. Uh, you may remember um, General Flynn told a television audience that uh, ISIS was a willful decision of the Obama regime and that it was a decision made contrary to General Flynn's advice, who advised them not to send ISIS to Syria. So I think with Flynn there, uh, controlling the flow of information to the president, uh, the National Security Advisor really is a very important position. It can neutralize the Defense Department, it can neutralize the State Department, it can neutralize the CIA. Uh, and he was in a position to be of great help to Trump in diffusing the relations. And so they realized that. And they went after him. And they flooded all kinds of lies about Flynn and they put so much pressure that Trump's relatively inexperienced advisors like Bannon said oh we have to get rid of the problem this will go on forever we'll never be able to move forward with the agenda and so we'll just have to let him go well that was a decision in my opinion that broke the back of the Trump administration. And consequently, uh, the, appoint the appointment since have been Russophobic. His new national security advisor is a Russophobic guy. And of course, they're also, all of them, very much against Iran, which, of course, Russia and China can't afford to abandon. So the situation is ripe for more conflict. So let's say I'm wrong then, and I'm quite prepared to be wrong, and he wasn't chosen, and he I'm started out. Yeah, let's let let let's say he wasn't chosen. What you're oh, saying yeah. is, what what you're saying is, 
is that whether or not he was chosen, what he is now is just another corporate neocon stooge, right? That's what he is now today. Well, I wouldn't quite go that far. I would say because he hasn't appointed outright neocons. You have to understand the neocons are extremely dangerous, but just the normal uh, neoliberal American foreign policy, it's also aggressive. It's just not as aggressive as the neocons. Uh, you know, the, the Kissinger Brzezinski school is fairly aggressive. Uh, it's not neocon. It, it doesn't claim American hegemony over the whole world. It just claims that, that uh, the United States can't afford not to be number one, but not that there's not a number two and a number three. So I don't think we would go that far, Richie. Uh, I think it's quite clear he wasn't chosen because the media was after him from the very beginning all during the Republican uh, primary. In fact, most of the Republican Party was after him. It wasn't just the Democrats attacking him, the entire media, the Republican Party. And uh, during the presidential campaign, of course, the media was totally against him. And the media is very much in the pockets of the CIA. It has been, always. It's a product of the Cold War. I mean, so is your media. You don't think Britain has an in, a media independent of the CIA, do you? It, cer it certainly does <laughs> not. You're absolutely that. right. You're right. It, it certainly Germany doesn't, or France, or Italy, or Belgium, or the Netherlands. None of them do. You're absolutely right. Canada, yeah. Or Australia, I mean, or Japan. These are all... We, we even had a book written by one of the editors of the largest newspaper in Germany who says every significant journalist in Europe is on the CIA's payroll, me included, he said. That's right. So, so you know, if there's no reason, if you're against Trump, uh, you don't try to damn him like that. So I don't think there's any prospect whatsoever that he was ever uh, chosen. Uh, he's hated uh, by identity politics because he's a white heterosexual male billionaire, so he's not a victim group. You see, all the terrible things Obama did, they accepted because he's America's first black president. So identity politics makes it imperative to support him, but not Trump. It makes it imperative to hate him. <laughs> the, the, only, the only person you're allowed to hate, the only, or the only, uh, how would you put it, uh, identity, politics, group. people are allowed to hate. The only ones not protected by political correctness are white heterosexual males. You can say anything about them, but you can't say anything about women and, and blacks and Hispanics and, and homosexuals and lesbians and transgenders. They're all protected by the vocabulary, by political correctness, uh, they're victim groups. So Trump's exposed in a way that Obama wasn't. But just look at all the fuss, Richie, over the travel ban. Uh, the same people fussing over the travel ban never raised the voice about 16 years of bombing of the Muslims the indiscriminate slaughter of millions of people, destructions of the infrastructure, entire countries in ruins. The Ninth Circuit didn't say a word. No, nothing. You didn't. So all of a sudden, though, it's become awful to say, well, we don't want them to come in the States because, you know, then maybe they harbor some thoughts of revenge. After all, we've been slaughtering them for 16 years. Yeah, but that's not what Trump said now. <laughs> Maybe they'll do something back to us. Fair enough, but, but that's not what Trump that's, said, Paul. But it's right to kill them, but you can't not let them come in the country. And what we see, listen to me, this is very serious. The United States citizens have completely lost the due process right. They have no due process because the two presidents have said we can pick them up 
and detain them indefinitely despite due process. And not only that, but America's first black president said, I can also kill them without due process. <laughs> so American citizens don't have due process, but non-citizens, oh, the Ninth Circuit's rule, oh, they have due process. And Trump's travel ban violated due process. Well, of course, the U.S. Constitution doesn't apply to foreigners. It applies to Americans. It applies to Americans. Yeah. Can I can I just come in on that, Paul? Let me just let me just come in on that because you're you're absolutely right. Um, the Hollywood liberals never breathed the word about U.S. bombing campaigns overseas. You're absolutely right to make that uh, point. But on the point of tr- you know Trump saying, you know um, you know we've been bombing them for years. Trump's travel ban. Um, wasn't so much to do with the possibility of revenge as Trump adhering to the the myth that, you know, there are bad jihadists who uh, want to come and kill us. What Trump wasn't saying, and I think you'll have to agree with this, Trump wasn't saying, by the way, our intelligence agencies created this horrendous terror group, this, you know, Saudi Wahhabist nightmare that is ISIS. Now I'd love Trump if Trump was to go on television and say some of the things that you say when you write in your articles. We create these monsters to destabilise countries like Syria. But Trump doesn't say that. He's playing to the myth that radical Islam is a threat to the world. That's why we should have the travel ban. And I, Listen, he can have a travel ban if he wants. You know, he's, he's the president. He can do that. He was elected, but not for those reasons, though. But it's not irrelevant, Paul, because American people don't know, it, unless they're reading paulcraigroberts.org, Americans do not know how ISIS came to be and how Syria came to be in the mess it is now, right? Well, they do know because uh, General Flynn told them. He's gone, though, isn't he? What? <laughs> but, but as you quite rightly said earlier, he's gone. Yeah, but he's, he said this on TV. It's known. This is this is why they, they removed him. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the point, Richie, is Americans, when it comes to being locked up in prison for life without a trial, when it comes to being murdered without due process, this is now the fate of Americans if the president decides that. Yet, foreigners have due process. Yeah. I hear (laughs) you. you How do you get a situation where foreigners have more rights than the citizens? And that's what we now have. That comes out of this ninth panel, this ninth circuit panel of judges. It comes now out of the uh, liberal progressive left press out of the Democratic Party. So we now have a situation where the United States Constitution no longer applies to American citizens. It only applies to Muslims who want to come into the country. <laughs> you know, you've got to admit, this is hilarious. And it, it, it shows the utter total stupidity of the situation in the United States. It's, it's got nothing to do with Trump. <laughs> this is this is an extraordinary thing where the citizens are no longer protected by the Constitution. <laughs> Only the Muslim refugees from our wars. Tell me this, Paul. What? I'm not saying that I'm against the Muslims. I'm, I'm the one who has always said from the beginning this thing was a hoax. <laughs> it was a cooked up hoax for the neoconservatives to make the Middle East safe for Israel. And it was a cooked up hoax to replace the missing Soviet threat because the military security complex need to justify its budget. It's got to have an enemy. So I've always said the Muslim threat is a hoax. Though now I think possibly after 16 years of being bombed and killed and destroyed, uh, probably some of them probably don't like us. Yeah, of course, yeah. (laughs) Let me ask you then, just to go back to this, and then I want to talk about France and Holland, and I know you've written about the movements in France 
uh, the nationalist movements, which I have a lot of sympathy with, as you'd probably expect. But before we talk a little bit about that, let me just remind people, Paul's website is paulcraigroberts.org. That's paulcraigroberts.org. Terrific articles on there. Links to Paul's excellent books as well. Um, the Neoconservative Threat to World Order, The Failure of Laissez-Faire Capitalism, and others. Um, so on that then, Trump's supporters, and I'm not counting you as one, I think you're um, generally, I think, not generally, I think pretty much always, you're very objective in your writing. But but his supporters believed that he meant it when he said interventionalism was going to go, that he was going to pursue better relationships with Russia, he described in graphic detail his belief that it was all wrong going into Iraq and Afghanistan. This gave people great hope, so much so that they believed that he would, you know, come clean about these interventions and about the destabilisation of these countries and about the hoax of radical Islam, as you so um, properly described it there. But then he doesn't back Flynn. He appoints these people, Paul, that you quite rightly say in your excellent article, and I'm not, I'm not kissing your backside, it's it's a brilliant article. He appoints H.R. McMaster, Mad Dog, Fiona Hill. What yeah. the hell is going on, Paul? Nobody forced him to do this. Why is he behaving no, like this, Trump? You're wrong. He was forced. He was forced. By who? Uh, by the military security complex and by the media. You, you, look, He's been in office two months under constant attack uh, with even Republicans demanding an investigation to see if he had committed treason. Uh, th there are massive petitions to have him impeached. And of course, he just reached the conclusion, well, uh, they're more powerful than I am. And I think that's the case. I said early on that the president ha has a certain amount of power, but it doesn't match the power of the deep state because the deep state's been there for 60, 70 years. And it's unaccountable. And most people don't even know who or where it is, including the president and the Congress and the man Office of Management and Budget and everybody else. Uh, this is a parallel government. And it does what he wants. And I think that this was a shock to Trump that the president could be so mistreated by his own CIA. <laughs> and, he, and he couldn't do anything about it. So uh, I think he just realized, hey, gosh, being president isn't what I thought. Has he been I'm, threatened, do you think, Paul? Has he been threatened? Well, of course he's been threatened. No, he's I mean serious threats. The media. Every day in the media he's threatened. He's threatened with impeachment, with hearings, with investigations. Yeah. Uh, it's constant. Yeah. Oh, do you mean does the CIA tell him we're going to kill you if you... I don't know. I, I don't yeah. Know that... I mean the deep state you talked about they there, yeah. To, Richie, they don't have to tell him that. He just sees the response to what are sensible policies. What's more sensible than having good relations with the other major nuclear power? Nothing is more sensible than that. Yeah. That's the most important thing on earth is for Russia and the United States to have stable relations, confidence in one another, trust in one another. What we've had now the complete destruction of the Russians' trust in the United States, going all the way back to the Clinton regime. We broke every agreement, every treaty. We've told every lie. There's no trust there on the Russians' part. How can they trust people like us, That the things we've done, the misrepresentations, the threats, the name calling? It's, in, it's essential to restore this trust. The, the whole life of the planet is hangs in the balance. And so, yes, I said, Trump said he understands that. He'd rather do business with them than go to war with them, which makes perfect sense. And so we thought we had a chance. We had no chance with Hillary. How, how can you have the president 
of the United States be a woman who's called Vladimir Putin the new Hitler. Yeah. You can't have that kind of president. The woman who engineered through Victoria Newland the coup in the Ukraine that's caused all these troubles for Russia, including the sanctions, because that became you know, our, our myth about the Russian invasion of Ukraine became the reason for the sanctions that we forced on the hapless European vassals of Washington. So all of this trouble needed to come to an end, and, and we had the prospect of it. Uh, Flynn, and he's gone. And I think it was a mistake. I think probably Bannon made it by just saying, well, you know, this is going on so long, we can't get, we can't move forward, we can't do anything. We just have to find somebody else. So this was blood in the water, and it just made the attacks escalate because it tended to uh, give credits to the charge. So, oh, you had to get rid of him. Oh, because he talked to the Russians. So talking to the Russians became a crime. And so they got after him for talking to the Russians. And now we've had all of these kinds of CIA leaks that Trump was talking to Russian intelligence. I mean, these are absurd things. Absurd, yeah. They, they play in the New York Times and Washington Post like they're just everyday facts. The deep state then, Paul, the deep state, the the tyrants pulling the strings, they want to progress things to possibly a global conflict involving the NATO alliance with Russia, maybe China on the other side. There's no doubt about that. And if you're, think- yeah, let me just finish this question. If you're right, and I think you are, you've said it's over, there'll be no change this time uh, with Trump. What, how, first of all, how incredibly depressing that is, even though you're right. What does the ordinary men and women of the United States, what can they take from that? What can they do about the course with which they're being set upon that they have no control over? What are they to do, Paul? I don't know. Yeah? I don't know. You know, they, I don't know. We have to, you know, people can surprise you eventually. But I don't uh, really know. I don't think, Richie, that uh, that the military security complex intends to have a war with Russia. They intend to have Russia as a threat. And so what they object to Trump is that he was removing the threat with normal relations. I don't think the military security complex wants to have a thermonuclear war. I think even they are smart enough to yeah, know yeah. there won't be Not a nuclear left. war, no. But what they want is a serious threat. They want the Cold War back uh, in spades. And so they need a major power with all kinds of nuclear weapons, and Russia fits the bill. Uh, the Muslim terrorists don't. So they they want Russia as a threat, and that's what they object to Trump for, because he says, no, we've got to have them as uh, business partners, as uh, normal relationships. So I I don't think they want to have a war, but I think they're going to get a war simply because, like I said, there's too many ways that the information can be misperceived. You can get another, suppose Russia gets another report, incoming American missiles. They're going to be more inclined to believe it than if Trump was normalizing relations. So if they hear instead uh, the uh, NATO commander saying about all this stuff about Russia, which they say every week, if you just look at some of the statements that come out of the NATO commanders, out of the EU, uh, out of the Pentagon, you know, wherever. It's always the Russians are a threat, they're doing this, they're going to do that. Uh, they could invade the Baltics any time, some idiot American general said not long ago. So when you, when you keep feeding people uh, this image that you have of them, 
And they believe it. And they say, well, Dan, they are going to attack us. Why are they having all these constant military maneuvers? Why are they putting uh, anti-ballistic missiles on our borders? Why are they doing all this if they don't mean to do something? So the provocations that the United States is responsible for or is creating a frame of mind in Russia of being threatened by the West. And this is dangerous. This is not what you want. You don't want them to be threatened. You don't want them to feel threatened. And it's also what they're doing in Washington. They're trying to make the Europeans and the American people feel that they're threatened by Russians, which is a joke. So I just don't know uh, how this can come out good. And Trump was a chance. Like I said, he, he was a strong, determined, egocentric man. Uh, but he seems to, he fights back on Twitter. I mean, he does stand up to the press. He ridicules them on Twitter and doesn't, you know, uh, back away from it. But he doesn't now have, as far as I can tell, a government capable of normalizing relations. And they're trying now to get him to uh, use better relations um, to achieve something else, maybe to break up the Russian-Chinese alliance or other things that will just make Russia and China more suspicious and less trusting. So I think on the whole, uh, that, that's the situation. They, they don't want war, but they want an enemy. And if you have an enemy, you always have a chance. To and you can, you can scare people. I mean, look, you're absolutely right. I don't see the thermonuclear thing either. But I think what you're hinting at is more of these proxy wars fought out in various parts of the world, like we're seeing in Syria. And of course, that's just as bad. You mentioned there, Paul, about the Twitter thing. This is what I can't understand, and I've been working in commercial and national media for years. I don't understand this Twitter nonsense. Forget his narcissism and his egocentrism. Why Trump wouldn't agree to a series of live one-to-one -one interviews with these very disgraceful, you know, alleged media outlets that we're talking about? And why Trump wouldn't sit down in a live situation in front of the American people and say, to, you know, put the onus back on these pathetic so-called journalists and say, listen to me. You know, if I'm Trump, I'm going to say, listen to me. Listen to me, not because I'm the president, but just listen to me for a minute. Are you really trying to tell me that it's okay to be carrying out military exercises on Russia's border with Norway? Are you really telling me that it's okay to be telling well, lie after lie. Why doesn't he do that, Paul? It's very simple. Richie, Richie obviously, it would just prove that uh, he was in Putin's pocket. He's trying to, we, we, he's in the situation now, Richie, where if you try to normalize relations with Russia, it means you're their agent. You're working in behalf of Russia. This is the way they've defined it. It's, it's not defined as you're working in order to have peace. No, I'm aware of that. If you want to have good relations with Russia now, essentially in the United States, it means you are either a Russian agent or a Russian duke. So he does nothing then, Trump. He does nothing. Let like, me finish this. Your audience needs to know this. You need to know this. Go ahead. I remember the prop or not list of 200 Russian agents. Yes. Okay, I was on that list. Well, now, According to Stephen Lindman, Harvard University Library has put out a list of Russian Duke agents. I'm on the list. So is Counterpunch. So is anybody who has ever said, hey, you know, it's risky to have bad relations between nuclear powers. That is enough to prove you are a Russian agent. So if he goes on TV with these CNN people or any of the rest of them, they're committed to getting him out of office, not to giving him a fair break. 
So if he, if he were to prevail in the debate, they wouldn't even run it. What they would do, they would say that Trump was out defending Russia again today. He would leave. Defended Russia in this way. He's always defending Russia. He's at it again. He's still defending Russia. That's, what, that's how it would play, Richie. That's all the American people would hear. They would hear, oh, he's defending Russia again. You see, I, I'm defending Russia right now. <laughs> Uh, according to the now look, this isn't some unknown proper not group that nobody's ever heard of. This is according to Stephen Lindman. I haven't had the time to check it out. Yeah, but yeah. He posted this and he says Harvard University Library has put out a list of fake websites. And so there you see, it's how bad it is. And how do you explain it? I've tried to sort of explain it in the limited time we have. And so I think it's a, a situation you have to be very much aware of. It's now very difficult to say anything sensible about Russia. You know, they started this, they, they started this type of attitude, creating this attitude that if you favor relations with Russia, there's something wrong with you. You may remember that Stephen Coyne, he is our last remaining Soviet expert, a Russian expert, uh, emeritus professor at both Princeton and New York University, two of our finest universities. His wife is editor of The Nation. Okay, early on, they, bland, they branded him some kind of a Russian dupe. <laughs> he, right. he, of course, knows more about Russia than the entirety of the Western press put together. And yet he's a Russian dupe because he said it's dangerous to go, go around threatening Russians. Uh, so he's a Russian dupe. We're back so to um, this has been going McCarthy, on. right? We're back, <laughs> we're back to the 50s. This is McCarthyism, right? We're back to that uh, again. I mean, there sure. are, yeah, there are people on Twitter saying, you know, Trump could do these interviews live and he could put these points right back to the interviewer. But I, I hear what you're saying, Paul. Paul's website is paulcraigroberts.org. Um, I've tweeted the article. Paul has been writing since there are other articles on, on, uh, online there. Let me just ask you this, Paul. We've got about four or five minutes left. And thanks, um, my friend, for staying around. I know you're writing and I got the time all wrong. That's the that's Irish. Okay, Richard, don't that's worry the, about it. That's the Irish in me, Paul. I should have realised. You know, I've been doing this for years and years, and every spring I get caught the same bloody way. I end up in trouble with the times. But look, I want to ask you this. I, I, I do a Sunday program, and we we talk about on the program. We look at certain issues that people might not be aware of, and it turns out that last week, Richard Haas, who you know all about. Um, he's the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He spoke to Goldman Sachs and he said something very sinister, um, which wasn't, of course, picked up by the media. Why would they? Um, he was talking about the state of the world right now and the reasons we are in disarray. And the reasons we are in disarray, he said, it's because we continue to let so-called sovereign states do things in their own self-interest that cause problems for the rest of us good guys. And he proposed in front of a group of Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, bankers um, that we, you know, move to World Order 2.0, he called it, which is basically just another way of saying we really need to progress this one world government agenda and we penalise people who break the rules. How much should people pay attention to the likes of this guy, Paul, and where he comes from and, you know, who's listening to him? How serious are these guys in the grand scheme of things? Well, he speaks for the ruling establishment. Yeah. You have to understand the new, what the new world order means simply is American hegemony over the world. It, it doesn't mean some kind of a world-based democratic government. It means the American empire. And, and, of course, what's in the way of the empire is Russia, China, and to a lesser extent, Iran. So these countries are in the crosshairs. And uh, 
And this is why we uh, have so much animosity toward them and so much proclivity to conflict. The, when the Americans say that uh, something is going wrong in the world, what they mean is that the United States is losing control or doesn't have complete control uh, and needs complete control, and the world is never okay until Washington has complete control over everything. That's what it means. It doesn't mean anything else. And so it's emerging of the old neoliberal uh, international interventionist with the neoconservative American world hegemony with the material interest of the military security complex and the banks. Because, of course, the more dominant America, the more dominant the American financial institutions. So that's what it means. It means uh, the rest of you guys got to get in line. I mean, why do you think the pound is doing so poorly and under such attack? It's, uh, it's Washington paying you back for Brexit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so there's all kinds of ways that uh, Washington has of paying people back and, um, and including me. <laughs> and, and including you. And, and the currencies, of course, are easily manipulated. Anyway, I want to just say something to, to you before we go. Uh, I want to finish on a positive. When you were due to come on last Thursday, I do what I always do. I had a good look around uh, paulcraigroberts.org. Now, I read your website every week, but I like to go back to the archives to find some of the stuff to see if I can catch the great man out in flip-flopping or changing an opinion. Um, and I didn't manage to catch you out, so that's good news. But I did find an article that made me laugh. Back in 2012, you wrote a fantasy article. It was hilarious. Um, funny, but but also kind of, uh, I would say, pithy and also sad. Um, it would be the Paul Craig Roberts cabinet. If you got to select your own uh, cabinet, it was fantastic. You had Norman Finkelstein as the uh, U.S. ambassador to Israel. You had Gerald <laughs> Sal- you had, Yeah, it was hilarious. You had, I, I actually said on Thursday, they deserve, they deserve Finkelstein. I mean, they properly... I know Norman quite well. I've interviewed Norman many times. Uh, you had Salente in there as well. You had some brilliant characters. It was just very funny. But you know what? After laughing for a few minutes, I kind of sighed and I thought, you know, what a different world it would be, Paul. What a what different world it would be, eh? Listen, um, thanks again for uh, coming on and thanks for sticking around. Uh, it's paulcraigroberts.org, folks. Check out Paul's uh, terrific articles there. And listen, no doubt soon again we'll be back discussing these issues as things continue to happen. Paul, thanks again. Love chatting with you, my friend. Fun talking to you, Richard. Look after yourself. The great Paul Craig Roberts on the line to us there from his home. He's back to work uh, now on his website.